All right. Hello, everyone. I'm very glad to be here in Kuwait. And uh, thanks, Anwar and Saud, for putting this uh, conference together. Uh, I'm always glad to see a group of people interested in crypto coming in together and talking about the latest developments. Uh, all right, make up the slides. Um, okay, uh, so uh, myself, my name is Ala Dudin. I'm uh, co-founder and CEO of BitOasis. Uh, we're the largest, uh, and right now I think the first uh, digital asset exchange that uh, started in the region and focused on the GCC market widely and other parts of the Middle East and North Africa. We started in 2015, and it's been an interesting uh, four years for us so far, observing the market and seeing the adoption growing in the last, I would say, 18 months specifically. Uh, and it's been a roller coaster ride, but a lot of great developments happening in the, in the market, uh, especially in the GCC right now. So that's what I'm going to be talking about um, today. What I'm not going to be talking about is enterprise blockchains, uh, banks building blockchains or, or private applications, um, that we've seen a lot of narrative and talk happening in the region on that. Um, we do get very often uh, banks and other governments approaching us to build blockchain applications and we try to educate them on the fact that we are focused on public blockchains, on um, uh, crypto asset applications, uh, focus on the consumer market as a B2C platform. We're not in the business of building uh, enterprise private blockchains and we try as much as possible to differentiate between both. I think there's a lot of recent statistics coming out from the region that in 2018 the blockchain spending have uh, skyrocketed from 37 million to 80 million USD. Uh, when I've looked further into this data, it was mostly on private blockchain applications. So you know, you've seen obviously a lot of governments uh, across the GCC, some projects happening in United Arab Emirates, in Saudi, uh, some banks also, I think banks in, the UAE, in, in Kuwait as well, looking into private blockchain applications. And, and, and this is uh, obviously a one viable blockchain application or adoption of it. But I think there's another story here, which is the adoption of cryptocurrencies and digital assets, as some other people call them, and the consumer adoption of that and, and what, what the future uh, uh, can be. And um, as part of that, obviously, I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, BitOasis, a company. So uh, at BitOasis, we're focused on building the on-ramps and the off-ramps to um, uh, uh, crypto assets and public blockchain. So we are an exchange, a wallet, and an API platform that allows people to buy, sell, and trade cryptocurrencies. And you might ask, why do people want to uh, buy and sell or store crypto assets? We think that public blockchains are a way to build a new in infrastructure for a uh, an open financial services. And the first way of doing that is building the infrastructure, which is mainly wallets and exchanges to provide the liquidity of different crypto assets in the market. And then second, uh, to allow people to have secure uh, tools uh, to use uh, those assets and eventually transact on public blockchains. We, are, uh, we started in 2015, um, mainly based in, in Dubai with teams across the region, and then we've got um, tech teams uh, based in other, uh, outside of the region as well. And um, we are open as an exchange um, to the wider Gulf market with crypto to crypto uh, pairs and, and trading uh, recently in Jordan, Egypt, and Morocco. Uh, we've got 10 digital assets uh, with 17 trading pairs available uh, across the region as well, obviously with full compliance, AML and KYC, and working very closely with regulators. Uh, since launch, we've uh, right now facilitated or traded over 2 billion USD, uh, mostly in fiat uh, crypto pairs, and also we've got close to uh, 200,000 customers across the region. Uh, a lot of it is concentrated, obviously, in the Gulf, because that's where our main exchange uh, is based. In terms of adoption that we're seeing right now in the region, um, obviously it's, very, it's similar to other jurisdictions uh, in, in terms of looking at crypto assets uh, as a new asset class. So I think we're primarily right now in the investment phase or what would people call investing in, in crypto assets. Uh, and, and we've seen that's the biggest use case uh, on our platform across the hundred thousands of customers that we have across the region where 
uh, you know, close to, I would say, 95% of the activity is really uh, uh, adopting or buying and selling crypto assets as a new uh, asset class. And, and, and that's been the biggest driver, obviously, of growth. We do see a niche or um, close to like 5% or a little bit less uh, of, of volumes or people transacting uh, using crypto assets for utilities or, you know, payments or uh, consumer applications. And, and that's really this kind of small segment of users that I find the most interesting because off of that, of like re early adopters that are using crypto assets for utility or consumer applications, you can kind of build future applications uh, using public blockchains. Um, so we're really kind of moving from an investment phase to utility phase very, very, very slowly. And with the introduction of uh, new crypto assets or decentralized applications, I think that adoption uh, uh, will, will, will start growing more and more. Uh, obviously, you need the exchanges, you need the on-ramps and the off-ramps to facilitate that sort of adoption across different markets. And obviously, we're, we're, uh, that, that's our biggest mission, uh, being uh, the, the biggest player here in the region. Uh, in terms of active markets, our most active market right now, uh, primarily retail, I would say, is, is the UAE. Um, second to that is uh, Saudi Arabia. After Saudi Arabia, we have Kuwait. Kuwait is actually a very active market uh, in, in crypto among uh, you know, consumer user base. And then after uh, Kuwait, we've got Egypt, which is also a big promising market for us. Uh, the interesting thing in, in this breakdown, I think a lot of it is, is driven uh, based on the localization that we have on our platform, uh, but I would say the, the most interesting market for us in 2019 is really Saudi Arabia, where we see uh, per user a lot more uh, you know, volume and transactions uh, compared to all the other markets that we have or we serve on our platform. And my prediction is that in 2019, the biggest growth will be give, uh, coming, uh, still obviously from the wider Gulf region, but specifically... Uh, Saudi Arabia. And then in terms of top traded uh, assets, BTC is still king. I think that's the biggest volume, the biggest adoption. It's the first thing that people buy. It's the first thing they try transacting with. Uh, after uh, Bitcoin, we've got Ether. And then third widely used and traded assets is XRP, uh, which is trying to figure out really what the use case there. I think a lot of it has been driven by speculation, uh, which is different to uh, BTC and Ether. Uh, obviously, with, with Ether, a lot of the adoption has been driven by participating in ICOs or because with the ICO pickup that happened, obviously, in 2017. Um, and then, obviously, with the ICO market sort of kind of dying off temporarily right now, the biggest adoption is still Bitcoin uh, by far more than any other token uh, on the platform. Uh, obviously, in, in BitOasis, we're interested in various types of applications, decentralized applications, that we think will form the building blocks of a open financial services. So these range from payments and financial applications. You know, I think there's, uh, in 2017, we've seen a, uh, a pickup, well, sorry, 2018, pickup in new stablecoin projects. Uh, some of it is fiat-backed, and some of them are algorithmically backed uh, tokens. I think there uh, is a promising uh, adoption and uh, an opportunity to build uh, decentralized financial applications based on stable coins, specifically in the region where we see a, um, a, a big demand for electronic or new uh, uh, payment options, uh, specifically also in Egypt where we have a huge market segment of unbanked uh, population. Decentralized identity protocols is another thing and obviously file storage and decentralized exchanges is some of the things that we're looking at in terms of the next five years or so, but I would say in terms of low hanging fruit where we would see an adoption beyond the speculation phase is really around payment services uh, or applications that would extend uh, uh, pay, new payment services for our clients uh, in, in the region. It's sort of like an overview of what we generally look at on a day-to-day basis. Um, I think the biggest story in 2018 when it comes to the region, uh, and, and, and some of you have probably also seen it across the news, is the new regulatory frameworks that have been coming out in the region in 2018, and I think some of them have been uh, or will be seeing the light in 2019. In order to build an ecosystem uh, that is healthy, that can uh, sustain itself, and also break into the mainstream adoption, you need innovative and progressive regulatory frameworks. Um, for you know, quite some time when people ask me, how is the ecosystem looking like in the Middle East? Uh, what's the adoption like? I would say we're in a very nascent stage uh, uh, at this point. I mean, the fact that um, as 
an exchange landscape. You know, we're, we're sort of the biggest right now in the region, and obviously there are new entrants coming in from either international exchanges coming into the market or new startups that are coming into exchange. Is a promising sign that uh, the market is growing. Uh, there are more serious players coming into the market, and I think we're seeing early signs of an ecosystem actually building and coming together with new players coming to the market, us scaling and growing you know, year after year. Uh, it's funny because 2018, even with the market going into a bear state, it's still been a better year for us than 2017. I was kind of looking at the whole year in total. And with the new regulatory frameworks that have been coming out in Abu Dhabi and now recently in Bahrain, I think uh, you're going to see a tighter collaboration uh, with the regulators, with uh, uh, innovators and companies in the space, but also uh, it's, uh, it's, it's welcoming new corporates and banks to come into the crypto asset space and not kind of shy away from it and just focus on uh, private blockchains, which is what we've seen a lot of kind of the hype been uh, about in, in the last two to three years. Uh, so definitely promising early signs of an ecosystem, a crypto asset ecosystem building in, in, in the region, specifically here in the Gulf. I think Kuwait has a big opportunity also to put out new frameworks uh, that uh, builds a friendly environment for exchanges, for wallets, for anyone who's building basically a crypto asset application or, or a new protocol. Uh, to, to, to build it here in Kuwait. It's all about having the right regulation and having the right uh, support as well because in, in, when we started in 2015, obviously we started working very closely with the regulators when we started and that paid off for us because once we've had those licenses out, obviously it was just a matter of acquiring those licenses. But there's a lot of education that comes uh, uh, and has to be done before those frameworks have been put out. And for us, it's been like a, a constant education and back and forth with the regulators for the last three years. And obviously, that's been a fruitful uh, endeavor for us at, at, at this stage. Um, so quickly highlighting what obviously been happening on regulation, which I think is the biggest story in 2018. So we've seen um, new frameworks and licenses specifically targeting custodians, uh, crypto custodians, asset exchanges, et cetera. Uh, uh, that are being welcomed to set up full regulated operations in uh, you know, Abu Dhabi global markets, that's in Abu Dhabi, uh, in, the, in Bahrain as well. Uh, the Central Bank of Bahrain have recently put out consultation papers for exchanges to be uh, regulated in Bahrain, and I think the licensing framework will be out uh, in, in the next month or so. Um, and I think we're seeing more and more interest from other Gulf countries to also put in their uh, uh, frameworks in place. So we're in constant communication with the regulators uh, in, in Saudi, so Osama, CMA, which is the Capital Markets Authority, and then other regulators as well that are in UAE. And I, and I would also, as part of being in, here in Kuwait, would love to connect with uh, Central Bank in Kuwait and other regulators over here to sort of uh, uh, transfer some of the knowledge that we've acquired with working with regulators across the GCC. Because I think there's a big opportunity to build a solid crypto asset an ecosystem here in, in the region. Um, and then some predictions that we have for 2019 and uh, onwards in 2020, uh, with unlocking this new regulation and licenses to build or, or to support the ecosystem here in the region, I think you'll definitely see more mature regulations and rulemaking across the wider region and not just in the Gulf. So that would transcend across the uh, bigger Middle East and North Africa region. Obviously, you'll see more interesting uh, new companies coming in, companies like us uh, scaling and, and, and growing bigger and bigger, more fundraising, more funds getting interested and having a vertical around crypto assets. So you'll see like different stakeholders and ecosystem players coming in together to support that. Uh, that's definitely something that we'll, we'll see in the next couple of years. And then you'll see more corporates, um, traditional financial services players coming in and obviously plugging in crypto asset tools and solutions to their existing uh, operations or existing offering to their clients. Um, and, and you'll see a tighter collaboration uh, uh, in the next couple of years to uh, support that ecosystem further and further. And, and, and all of that, obviously, to the better of the ecosystem and also primarily to provide better and more secure services to consumers uh, in the wider Middle East and North Africa region. Uh, so that's just sort of my take on what's been going on in the region in the last uh, uh, couple of years and then what the outlook looked like for uh, 2019 and 2020. Uh, so right now we're in those markets primarily focused 
in, uh, on the GCC region, but I would like to see is just a lot more on-ramps and off-ramps and a wider coverage uh, for crypto asset services and products across the wider region. So this whole map needs to kind of look more, more green and, and we're, we're working on that closely along with our customers uh, and, uh, and, and the regulators in those markets as well. So that's my two cents in terms of what's been ha going on in the region so far. And I think it's definitely promising in the next couple of years. So thank you. Thank you, Ola. And uh, on that note, oh, do we have any questions for Ola? Okay, can you come back up, please? <laughs> Thank you. Great. Questions? Who would like to go first? Yep, please. Uh, hello, Ola. Thank you very much for the amazing presentation and the outlook. It looks uh, really promising. Uh, this is Khaled Lemnais. I'm an FX trader at Burgan Bank. I had uh, two questions for you. Uh, with regards, you said that in 2018, although it was a bear market, you performed better than 2017, given that the, pri the cryptocurrency market has collapsed. Can you please elaborate on that point? This yes. is my first question. Okay, do you wanna? Yeah, and the second question, uh, you mentioned that in terms of uh, user and volume, it was UAE, K uh, Saudi, Kuwait, and then Egypt. Mm. Uh, how much of that is retail investors and how much of that is institutional investors? Mm. And when do you think, or what kind of environment, legal environment, do you think that uh, you would like to see, to see institutional money coming into the, uh, to the crypto environment? Okay, Thank great. You. So with regards to your first question, so I think what's interesting in 2018 versus 2017 is the new people that came into crypto and adopted uh, crypto assets. So what we've seen in 2017 is that uh, primarily Q1 and Q2, that there, 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 uh, there used to be a market, uh, heavily I think more early adopters. Um, the crypto asset um, space in general or the technology itself wasn't as widely known or marketed as it is right now. And I think with the pickup of the price, price is always the best marketing tool when it comes to crypto assets. Unfortunately, though, it's what causes a lot of uh, uh, the pains around crypto assets as well with people, uh, unfortunately, uh, obviously being victims of some of the pumps and dumps schemes that happen in, 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 in the space. But what we've seen is that um, with the pickup uh, in the price spike that happened in uh, Q1, Q2, 2017, uh, the awareness around crypto assets and, and blockchains have, uh, have, have, have uh, grown tremendously. A lot of it was as a result, obviously, the media getting interested in it, people talking about it, the more content and articles around what are uh, you know, public blockchains, crypto assets, some of the interesting decentralized applications that have been built in the space as well. And you've seen uh, a lot more new, uh, primarily retail, entrance coming into the market. So overall, the market has grown, which is why I say 2018 actually has been a better year for us, because the market has significantly grown from 2017 to 2018 in the region. And then with regards to your second question, uh, that's primarily retail. And when it comes to institutional adoption, I think that one is interesting, because it needs a, a different infrastructure uh, in terms of actual products and setup of exchanges than retail, and also it needs a different regulatory uh, framework altogether to govern exchanges, custodians, uh, and other uh, uh, other products or companies that would tackle that um, that user base. Uh, so institutional adoption, I think, is 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 slowly kind of growing in the region. Uh, some of the new regulatory frameworks, specifically the one in Abu Dhabi, is tackling the institutional uh, uh, pie or like the uh, market segment. Um, and that's why obviously you see a lot of licenses focused on custody, custody solutions and all of that. So we're in the process of actually acquiring those licenses uh, to have that setup that allows us to tap into the institutional user base as well. Um, I think it's early days as well for institutional adoption, even in more mature markets 
where um, crypto exchanges have been operating for, for you know, years or since 2011. And, and that is a, um, an interesting market segment that a lot of people are trying to tackle you know, from the Coinbases of the world to you know, even us here in the region and some of the new exchanges that are coming in as well. So uh, it's definitely heavily retail at this stage and I think retail market will continue being uh, the, the dominant one with more consumer adoption happening across the region. Uh, but the institutional one is, we're just kind of scra scratching the surface there. And I think with more licenses and regulatory support, um, that interest will, uh, will grow further and further. More questions? I think he has a question. Okay. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Um, so I think it's definitely a technology that serves, uh, at the end of the day, the, the end consumer. It, it's a tool in the sense that it's, it's up to the companies and the people building those products uh, to obviously use that technology and adapt it into applications that people could use in their daily lives. Um, regulation is inevitable. Uh, regulation also, the right regulation, I think, that does foster innovation. Uh, is eventually needed in this space to uh, be able to scale to a mainstream uh, and, and break into larger user bases uh, at the end of the day. Um, so it, it's not kind of like a zero-sum game. You, you, you do need a multi-stakeholder approach for this industry to grow and eventually serve the end, uh, end user, the consumer. Primarily, so I hope that answered your question. Okay, cool. Okay. Thank you very much.